Ah, hello. It's me. Good, come on in. Come on in. Morning, Sue. Hallelujah. Well, God is good. Amen. All the time. Oh, I need to tra- we need to train you better, don't we? God is good. All the time. Correct, God is good. Hallelujah. We're here to worship Jesus. That's the most important thing we're going to do this morning. And uh, Ray's going to preach and uh, encourage us. Um, So, are you ready to worship this morning? Are you ready to worship Jesus? Paul the Apostle says, I think I mentioned it last week, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. This is your spiritual service of worship. And it's as we bring our whole selves, isn't it? Not just our voices, our whole bodies. Say, Lord, we're yours. We give ourselves to you. That's part of our worship. Not just singing songs, but we will sing songs. Amen? Amen. So come, let's stand. Let's uh, bring ourselves to God. Let's let praise rise. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. And hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Because when we see you, we find strength. To face the day In your presence All our fears Are washed away Washed away Hosanna Hosanna You are the God Who saves us Worthy of all Our praises Hosanna To face the day And in your presence All our fears are washed away Washed away To face the day And in your presence All our fears are washed away When we see you Cause when we see you We find strength To face the day And in your presence All our fears are washed away Are washed away Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Hosanna. The word means, oh, save us. So just let's lift our voices together. Just uh, welcome the Lord with a Hosanna. Just welcome him with a Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the King of Kings. One who reigns and rules. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we want to welcome you. Lord, with our songs, Lord, we want to welcome you with our praise. We want to welcome you with our prayers. Lord, we want to say thank you for your grace, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness. Lord, it never ends, and we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. I want to see you. Open the eyes Make this our prayer. Open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, Lord. I want to see you. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you.
I sit away through my groaning all day long. The day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach you. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, says the Lord. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy. All you upright in heart. Lord, I thank you that we can come and praise you and thank you for your salvation this morning, Lord, for your deliverance. Lord, it wasn't an easy win for you. You didn't come with an army of angels and sweep us all off to heaven, but you came and you suffered, Lord. You suffered the, 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 the pain that we should have known, Lord, you took our penalty, our price. Lord, you didn't shirk from that. You suffered for us. Lord, I thank you. Our, our salvation cost you a lot. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You praise this morning. Lord, that was you are worthy. Yes, Lord. God is a really a worthy God and he's seeking nothing more from us than to worship him passionately. To worship him from hearts that have been sold out to him. Not not from heart-filled hearts, but totally passionately to worship him. And Psalm 63. Um, says this, Oh God, you are my God. Can we say that this morning? Oh God, you, you are, my, are God. my God. Yes. Earnestly will I seek you. Yeah, seek you my Lord. inner self thirsts for you. My flesh longs and is faint for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. So will I bless you while I live. I will bless you. I will lift up my hands in your name. My whole being shall be satisfied as the marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Mm, yes, Lord. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches, you have been my help. Yes, you have. And in the shadow of your wings will I rejoice. Yes, Jesus. My whole being follows hard after you and clings closely to you. Your right hand upholds me. Father, I pray, may we be able to say, as the psalmist says, that we thirst for you in a dry and weary land. That we meditate on your word, Father. That when we lift our hands and our arms with praise, that it comes from hearts that are filled with passion for you. Lord, let our hearts overflow with understanding of who you are. Let the greatness of who you are overwhelm us. Let your power be seen in our midst. Let us fall down on our faces and worship you. Let us not be lukewarm, my God, but set your church ablaze once more with passion to worship you. Let the worship rise from this place that it will, that it will permeate in the, com in the community around. Let us not be silent in the presence of our God. When we can worship, let us worship with everything that is within us. I yeah, pray this in you, Jesus' Lord. name. Amen. Lord, you are an amazing God. Lord, you are an amazing God. Lord, you are an amazing God. And I love you. I love you, Lord, you are, Lord, you are an amazing God, Lord, you are an amazing God, Lord, you are an amazing God, I love you, I love you, looking in the sky. Looking in 
deny your glory. Gazing into space as you, the human race, appears. Seeing you in all your majesty, I wonder how it could be that you do. Yes. Who knows Trevor and Rachel Payne? Just put your hands up. So, I, oh, a good lot of us here. About a year ago now, she was sent home and given three days to live, and she's still living. And we have saturated her with prayer. Um, she's still got the cancer, but she's there. And uh, you know, Trevor is—he's uh, planted churches and done all sorts of things in his time but he's gone along to this Baptist church uh, which is 
traditional, to say the least. And he's got involved so much that he's preached a little bit. And this week, they're going to vote as to whether he can be a member. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, and Trevor's intention, I'm not on tape now, am I? Is basically that he will do with that church what we did here in the 1970s. Hijack it. <laughs> For God. And goodness knows what's happening, but they're going to vote for him to be a member, but they've already got him on the a new um, um, team because the pastor is also retiring today or, or leaving because he's fed up and he's going off to a charismatic church. I mean, it's, it's a real weird situation. It, really, it is. It's bonkers. But look here. Where, where is it? Su um, where, where? Ludlow. That's where they live. And, uh, you know, Trevor went down there. He never went down there to do this. He went down there to do something completely different. But there's a weird set of circumstances here. But God's in it. God's in it. So, so I would... Can we pray? Can we please yeah, pray? Let's pray? Because there are people there in that church that love the Lord. They've been thrilled. When he preached the other week, they clapped. And the pastor said, in 10 years, no one's ever clapped for me. <laughs> no one uttered a word. Um, but there's something happening. And, you know, we, and we, Jesus wants his church Amen. back. Amen. <laughs> And uh, so let's, and, and for Rachel, let's, let's just, can we call on God for them? Because she's, she should be dead, and yet God's still using her. She'll probably be there as well. And, uh, and Trevor never expected this. So this is the amazing God we have. Okay? Come on, let's all yeah, let's pray. pray. Yes, pray. Thank Lord. you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. We do, Lord. Thank Lord. you, Father. Thank you for this couple. Thank you, they've dedicated their lives to you. Lord Jesus, we remember the day they turned up at this place because they got baptised in the Holy Spirit and wanted the church, Lord, where they could express their newfound fervour. And Lord, now they're going to a place where there is little fervour. But they're your people there, Lord. And you want your people to be baptised in your Holy Spirit. And we just pray for Trevor and Rachel now. Lord, whatever they've got left, Use them, Lord. Yes, amen. Take pray. what they're offering and multiply yes. it, we pray. Be with Trevor as he preaches this morning. Be with Rachel. Touch her body with healing power as well, Lord. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Come on, let's pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you, you restore every heart that is open. Great are you, Lord. It's your in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise in your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Give life, you are love, you give life, 
You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your so good he's so great we need to be worshiping him don't we worshiping him we're going to take our offering as part of our worship please don't stop worshiping and and if we're giving by standing order that's fine let the basket go past but God knows and uh, someone told me a little funny story this week how that um, 
they just happened to have 10 pounds in their purse and they put it in the box and they thought oh well God I think Rob you said something like well God's able to give you back tenfold later that week someone gave them a hundred quid <laughs> and it just made them smile you know and we don't give so that we get but we give to God to honor him to love him to give him the first fruits of what we earn so that's why we're giving and it's part of our our dedication to him it's just as we sing to him we give to him you are here working in our midst I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, cause you are way maker. Wow. 
Whose glory taught the stars to shine Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing But this joy is mine Sing that again Who else, who else would rocks cry out to worship Whose glory taught the stars to shine Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing But this joy is mine With a thousand hallelujahs we Sing of all you've done, but I have eternity to try. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is for. Thousand hallelujahs and a 
just say hallelujah. Just say it. It means praise Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's mix them up with some hosannas. Hallelujah. Hosanna. King of kings. We worship you, Jesus. Let's not hold back. Come, let's have a time of just telling we love it. Oh, Lord, we love you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you. We don't hold anything back this morning, oh, God. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. Deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand lords. Worthy, isn't he? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Father, we pray. Oh, come and speak to us, Lord, through your word. We love your word, Lord. We love who you are. We love how you speak to us. Come, Holy Spirit, warm our hearts. Open us up, Lord God. We might receive all that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please do find your seats. Hallelujah. Ray, come and, come and speak to us. There's a microphone. Leave the thing up there. So whilst Ray's getting rigged up, let me just tell you, next Friday is Good Friday. It's a holy day. It's a bank holy day. It is. It is. It's called a bank holiday. And that's where that word comes from. It's a holy day. We're going to meet at 9 o'clock, and we're going to gather together. We're going to worship Jesus and break bread. What do you think? Who's up for that? Yeah. 9 o'clock. Right. We used to do it at 8 o'clock. Must be getting old or something. Going to win me... It was common sense, apparently, has won. The older vote has won. Maybe it's the younger vote. Who knows? Anyway, we're going to meet at 9 o'clock, and we're going to worship Jesus together. And I also want to give you another heads up. At the end of August, I think we have an opportunity of joining with another church to do effectively a weekend away, the last bank holiday weekend in August. Um, so more news about that. But that's kind of heads up. Uh, it's going to be a great opportunity, I think. So, amen. Let's welcome Ray. Okay, okay. Oh, there, there you go. What's today in the church's calendar? Yeah, Palm Sunday. That's why we're jumping umpteen uh, chapters in John. So let's go to John chapter 12. <clears throat> That's one reason why we're doing it. The other reason is because the powers that be have looked at this passage and they don't like it. Remember Trevor Payne once, he gave me a passage to preach from, and it was Abraham's burial ground. Oh I mean, what do you do with that? So, <laughs> and the verses I was given was from 12 through to 19. <clears throat> but as I looked at it, I thought, actually, unless you read the first, uh, the first 11 verses, actually, it don't make any sense. Because there's something here that needs unpacking. And to be honest, Sue loves it when, I be, when I'm giving scriptures that I would probably never choose to preach from myself because I have to do some work. And to be honest, I love it. Looking at the commentaries, praying, spending hours and hours just looking at uh, what others have said and just trying and getting inspiration. I tell you, that's what the Word of God is there for, all right? It's there for us to just dig into and, 
and let the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to read through here. Six days before Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. <clears throat> here, a dinner party was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with Jesus. When Mary took about a pint of pure nard, a very expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance. And that's not allegorical, folks. I know there's a lot of allegory here. We're not into that today. Um, it was genuine. Just the smell must have been amazing. <clears throat> but there's always a one. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot. Ooh, come on in. <laughs> who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Now, you know, this is the first time in the scriptures that who he was is actually revealed. And I phoned my friend John Corwell, Dr. John Corwell, this week. I said, <clears throat> I wonder whether Jesus actually knew I said, my view of the incarnation is that Jesus had to live in obedience to the Father and being led by the Spirit. So he didn't know unless, unless God showed him. I said, John, how do you feel about this? He said, I believe that's right. He said, there are others that don't believe that. But you know, he never pulled the God card. Because if he did, he's no help to us. Because we haven't got a God card. But we have the Holy Spirit. The same. Are you, with, are you on that line? Yeah. Otherwise, <coughs> you're out of membership. We'll vote on it next week. <coughs> but no, seriously, because, because sometimes we think somewhere Jesus could pull the card out of his pocket and cheat if he wanted to. He never did. You know, that's why it says in 1 John, we are to walk even as he walked. It's not possible if he pulled the God card. Yeah, so, so th th these things are important. So I, I, I sometimes, I used to think, I wonder if he knew one would betray him. Because in the Psalms, it's, it's all there. I just wonder sometimes if he thought, I, I hope to goodness it's not Peter. You know, you know that, that, that would be human thinking, wouldn't it? And, you know, so, so Jesus is, here we are. He's, he's here in, his, in his, his humanity, obeying the Father. And Lazarus is raised <laughs> is raised from it because it was the Father's will. <clears throat> he did not say this because he cared about the poor. But he was a thief. He was a keeper of the money bag and he used to help himself to what was put into it. He had his finger in the till. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, Many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. <clears throat> the next day, a great crowd that had come to the feast, this is Passover, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, and this is from the prophet Zechariah, do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had, and that they had done these things to him. Now, the crowd that was with him 
when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that, that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said one to another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world has gone after him. And then John, he's clever, John. He, he selects his material. The next verse is the world. Now some Greeks among them went up to the feast, inquiring after Jesus. Now, <clears throat> Father, help us this morning, because there's so much here, please. I want you to imagine one of your best friends is dying of a serious illness, um, a terminal disease. And he's got a couple of days to live, no more than that. You'd be, you'd be pretty down, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd be praying, you'd be, you'd, if you'd visit, if you could, but there, there, there would be sadness all around. <clears throat> and then somebody hears that there's, there's, there's a healing evangelist around. Um, Daniel Kayunda, do you know who he is? Yeah, well, he's amazing. He's amazing. A very ordinary guy. He succeeded Reinhard Bonnke. In fact, at the moment, right across uh, one of the African nations, instead of one crusade, there's 10 now. They've seen 83 million confess for Christ this year. There's amazing things. And we, we saw a miracle on, on the, um, yesterday as we were watching a video of um, just somebody who th 13 years had never walked. And in the meeting, just healed. And somebody carried his wheelchair. Amazing, eh? So, so Daniel Kyunders, he's in London, and somebody gets Daniel Kyunders and says, C could you come along? Our friend is dying. And he comes, he's a man of faith, and he'll pray. He doesn't know whether God's going to heal him or not, but he's got faith that God can. And God heals him. Wow! <laughs> and, and, well, there's going to be a party. <laughs> and you're invited. And you think, wow, party. And you go next door and you go, buy a bottle of champagne. And you, you come and, oh, it's such a, a festivity. Wouldn't it be great? Yeah. I'd love to have parties like that every week, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, let's go a step further. <laughs> Actually, your friend dies. <laughs> and then four days later, he's still in the mortuary. And someone gets hold of this Daniel Kayanda guy. And he prays. He comes alive. You might buy a magnum of champagne. There's a party. What a party that would be. <laughs> you know, and everybody wants it's gate crashed by everybody. Even some nasties are there. What a party. Can you just imagine it? Well, there's mixed reactions in this party as well, because some don't like it. They don't deny the miracle, but they don't like the implications of it. Especially the Sadducees, because they don't believe in the resurrection at all. <laughs> and they've got, a walking, they've got one walking around, enjoying a party, welcoming his guests. No, no, can you get, the, can you get the, the... This is a party. This is a celebration. This is over the top. And yet there's people there, they hate what's going on. Now they plot. They're not just going to kill Jesus, they're going to kill Lazarus as well. What a world we live in. This is the world we live in, folks, 2,000 years later. This is the world we live in. So, so what's going on in this, this first part of chapter 12? <clears throat> Well, this, is, this is my take on it. Um, this is pregnant with, with, with prophecy. There's so much prophetic stuff going on. Do you know what? I think sometimes we're prophetic and we, we, take, or we, and we have prophetic actions. And we don't know what we're doing, but we have a sense we're doing something. Do you know, I looked at a photograph this morning of, of three people, a, a mum and a dad, and a grown-up son who's now a doctor, and I can't tell you where they are because of what I'm going to tell you. But I was interviewing this guy, 
for years ago, probably 30 years ago, to become an elder in a church, to be the church leader. And I had this word of knowledge as I was speaking to him. Lisa, I was hoping it was a word of knowledge because I heard myself saying to him, you've never consummated your marriage, have you? And they've been married for years. And he said, how do you know that? I said, well, I, it's, it's either luck or God. <laughs> I, and God gave me a word of knowledge. And I said, you know, it's going to be very difficult for you to be able to minister to people with marital situations. Why have you never? And he told me this story and had a lot of surgery and then somehow time went by and they never did. So he never... So I said, well... There's a verse of scripture, what you need to do, do quickly. And they consummated the marriage. And there is this beautiful boy that was born. And today he's a doctor practicing medicine. And I just looked at that, and I said, because it's on our wall, just a little. And I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you so much that you give us fruit. And you just looked, looked there. And, and you know, so, so sometimes. God gives you something and you, you don't know why and you're not quite sure what to do with it, but you've got to do something. You've got to do something. You've got to be, you've got to be proactive in this. So when we look at this, there's some main players at this party, aren't there? Um, there's Jesus, obviously the guest of honour, because he raised Lazarus from the dead four days after he was entombed. Then there's Lazarus. He's a celebrity now. Everybody wants to see him. Maybe touch him. Is, is he really? Not a ghost. Not docetic. My goodness. My goodness. Today, we want his autograph, wouldn't we? We're clamouring around for his autograph. Can I have your autograph? And then there's the two sisters. There's Martha. Martha. What a spread she must have prepared. She was the hostess with the mostess, wasn't she? She really was. That's what she's known for. She gets a bad press sometimes, but I'd sooner go to a meal that she prepared than Mary, I think, <laughs> to be honest. <clears throat> then there's Mary. <laughs> and she's putting on a shocking display of love for Jesus as she anoints his feet with this expensive perfume that fills the house. And a nard is for burial. And it's, and it's for the head. <laughs> and she's prophetically anticipating something that is his coming death. And she hasn't got a clue that that's what it's all about. But this is speaking something. And, and I'll explain later why, I think. And maybe, maybe as she was anointing Jesus, maybe this scripture came into her head. Because scriptures do come sometimes to us, don't they? How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those or him who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Now, this, this, this procession, it's, it's, it's all to do with peace. Who brings peace, who brings good tidings, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And she's outrageous. Because she lets down her hair to wipe his... That is something a woman never does because it's basically saying something about her that was not true of Mary. It's really saying it's a, it's a loose woman. Um, one commentator says this, if you want to compare it today to the equivalent, it would, be, it would be a woman at a modern dinner party hitching up her long skirt to the top of her thighs. He said, that's what it is. And you can just imagine being at that sort of party and someone say, woman, have you no shame? Well, that's what it is. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it, for us to compare this stuff, but that would be, that would be the comparison, apparently. No, she stoops low, just like her master is to do in just a day or two at the Last Supper. Then there's Judas. <coughs> He knows a miracle of miracles has taken place, doesn't he? He's seen it. It's there. He was there. He's seen lots of other miracles. But he's so full of himself. He has nothing but scorn 
and evil intent. Can you believe it? And Jesus says to him, you leave her alone. And I just wondered as I was praying over this, I wonder if that's something that's echoed through 2,000 years of church history. That Jesus would scream at some, you leave this woman alone. You leave these worshippers alone. They're mine. Instead, she honours the Lord by anointing his feet, not understanding at all. (laughs) And then there's this horrible reaction. This is supposed to be a celebration, a party, and yet it's it's, it's mixed with, with reactions. And nobody doubts that a miracle has taken place. Eh? Well, it's there, isn't it? Four days is a long time. You don't go to sleep for four days. By the way, he didn't smell. No, he didn't smell. Should have done. The high priests, they know a miracle's taken place. They know healings have taken place. People are coming and keep reporting to them. So what do they do? They plot to kill him. And Lazarus to boot. We want no evidence of this. And the reason they're going to kill him, the two of them, because people are finding Jesus. They're coming to faith in their Messiah. Folks, man's depravity is frightening. It is. I was read, read a psalm this morning, psalm, psalm 7, and it's about justice and about David asking God what to do with his enemies. And I was praying about Putin. Lord saying, for goodness sake, let this be done to him. Let this be done. This, this is, there's such wickedness abroad across the land. And it's not just Putin, it's all over the world. Man's depravity is frightening. So let's come to the second part of this now. It's the Passover. What does the Passover represent? It's prophetic. It's the deliverance from Egypt by the blood of the Lamb over the lintels of the door. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Who is it prophetic of? The Messiah, Jesus. Zechariah, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you. Righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. The foal of a coat. And what do they do? They get palm branches down and they wave them and they put them on the ground. And it's just, do you know why they did that? Well, I'm going to tell you. Because in 175 BC, a Syrian ruler called Antiochus Epiphanes IV, it's a bit of a long name. It was a nasty piece of work. <clears throat> he attempts the annihilation of the Jews and their religion. It's a pre-Holocaust, if you like. And so he outlaws all Jewish traditions, festivals, celebrations. When that doesn't work, he also abolishes circumcision. Then he burns all the Torah, the books of the law, and, and he slaughters many of the temple priests as they defend the the Holy Scriptures. And then he sacrifices a pig to Zeus on the altar of the temple. And it fulfills the first prediction of Daniel who says, when you see the desolation of abomination standing where he should not. It's then, then AD 70 is the second fulfillment. So this this is so prophetic, this stuff. And the Jews revolt against Antiochus. And Matthias Maccabeus, with his six sons, they raise an army and they take the Syrians on for 24 years. A struggle which they won. In 164 BC, they cleansed the temple and celebrated this great deliverance as their warrior deliverer, Judas Maccabeus, known as the Hammer, 
rode on a war horse into Jerusalem. And what did they get? They took from the trees the palms and they waved them and they spoke. That's where this comes from. And it's the Feast of Hanukkah, one of the Jewish feasts. And so that's what's happening here, except this. Jesus now rides not on a war horse, not on a war horse, but on a donkey, a symbol of peace, <laughs> bringing God's freedom for all mankind. That's why we've, we've had to look at the first bit of this passage. It's just, I mean, it's wonderful, isn't it? Amazing. Just think, what, as he was coming into Jerusalem, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know how far it was, but we're talking, we're talking miles. I mean, how many, the crowd, how many were there there? Well, well at the feast, these feasts, the, 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 Jerusalem could have a million people. So goodness knows what it was like. Can you just imagine the hosannas and, and what was going on? Their expectations. Well, they must... Well, they were so high, weren't they? But they were soon dashed as Jesus was betrayed, falsely accused, and brutally crucified. Can you just imagine the, what's going on in people's emotions? The outcome, Roman tyranny remains. They believe that their deliverer, their Messiah, would deliver them from the Romans. His followers have dispersed. There's disillusionment, there's confusion, there's disappointment. There's deep hurt, much sorrow. Do you want to know the good news? But only for three days! <laughs> now, don't get it. I mean, if we try and put our place... They, I mean, they've had this party. I mean, all the, all the shenanigans that's going on there. Then, then they got this... Procession. Oh, and then. Oh. But only for three days. What has been prophetically witnessed in Bethany has happened. <laughs> so what can we take away from all this? Because this is important really, isn't it? Well, the first thing is this. That John is making a case here. All right? Folks, when we think of inspiration, we've got to understand that God works through people's skills and knowledge and learning. Um, I, actually, I don't believe John, who wrote this, is John, John the son of Zebedee. I don't believe that. He's, he's known as John the disciple, not John the apostle. And, and, and many scholars believe that actually because of his knowledge of how things work so much, especially at the end of his gospel when he goes through all, you know, being in the high priest court and all that sort of stuff, that he may well have been a son of one of the high priests. We don't know. We, we may know when we get to glory, it may not bother us, but it's interesting that there are these little, little, little things. It wasn't until the 5th fifth, fifth century that actually that they, they, it was reckoned to be John. Um, but it, it, it doesn't, doesn't really matter but, but what matters is this, whoever the John was, he was, he was skilled and gifted enough to know how to put a case together. Because why is he writing this gospel? I think very early on, Gareth said, so that we may believe. <laughs> this, is, this is evidence before us. It's evidence to convince us who Jesus is and to persuade us to be genuine disciples of him, the word became flesh and tabernacled, pitched his tent amongst us. And this is so important. Have we really been persuaded? See, we can be born again, but have we really been persuaded to be serious disciples, to be genuine disciples? Well, this, this is important. This is important because what is a disciple? Well, according to Jesus' definition, it's someone who, who observes all that he taught and did. Yeah, someone who's baptised. Waiting, waiting to be, for God to tell you to be baptised? Well, you'll wait till kingdom come because he's not going to tell you. He already has. That's right. He who believes and is baptised shall be saved. Yeah. 
That's it. So when people say to me, oh, oh I, I, I don't think I've heard from God yet, be baptized, that is nonsense. It's in the Word. If we, if we, if we, if we are his disciples, we are baptized. And I don't believe it's just our witness. I believe he does something because he loves the sacraments. Yes. Like when we break bread now, he loves these sacraments. He is in the sacraments if we have faith. That's what John Calvin said. It's not, it's not got to do with, you know, whether, whether, whether it's literally turned into blood or bread. Whenever we engage with God by faith, he does something. Do we believe that? So today we've prayed. He's in that. He will be do something. Okay. So it's so, so important. So John is right in this. He wants to convince us. And of course, John wrote for the Gentiles. That's why it's so interesting. He, he slips in there as soon as, soon as, as soon as uh, the, the, this was happening with Jesus had come um, to Jerusalem. The Greeks or the pagans, they were there straight away. That is prophetic. Yes. <laughs> because he didn't come for the Jews. He came for the new Israel. He came for those who would follow him and believe in him, whether Jew or Gentile. I was saying when we were in South Africa, because Steve's brilliant, he teaches on this one new man in Christ. But I said, you know, unless we have Jews in our congregation, we're not really one new man in Christ. We need Jews. I pray, God, help us. We well, need meet, meet some Jews so we can bring them to their Messiah so they can be completed. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> with Mary, we have a beautiful example of biblical worship. Now I know someone's going to preach on Mary because Mary's easy to preach on. But, but put it in the context. It, 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 it's amazing. <laughs> it, this is, we have a beautiful example of biblical worship. Now, we worship this morning, but if we, if we were to d describe worship, we'd, well, we'd talk about, you know, singing songs and this and that and other things, yeah, all included. But this is this worship. This is costly. It's costly. This perfume was 300 denarii, which apparently is, you know, take the Sabbaths out. It's a year's salary for, for a, a worker. It's honest. Unashamed. She's a spectacle. She don't care either. She don't care what others think. She just hoinks her. Yeah. And it's, it's humble. She acts like a servant, just like Jesus does. Oh, it's, it's amazing. It's interesting, in uh, 2 Samuel, remember the sequence when... The ark returned, the ark of the covenant returns to Jerusalem. Remember, David went through a couple of attempts, didn't he? The first attempt, um, Azza was it, sort of reached out and tried to, I don't understand that one, I'm just glad I wasn't there. <laughs> Some things are just difficult to understand. Seemed a bit unfair on poor old Azza. But there we go. And then, and then David brings it back. And, and, and he's so thrilled, he dances before the Lord, and he's only got his underpants on or whatever it is. He's only got his loincloth, and his wife, Michelle, is looking on, and she despises him. She says, you've made an exhibition of yourself, and she said, and it, you're just showing off in front of these slave girls. David was ecstatic in worship. This is what he says to her. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honour. And it says afterwards, it says, And Mishael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. In other words, she was barren. Why was she barren? She had a mean spirit. Folks, and I'm speaking to myself here as well. Sometimes people do go over the top in worship. And don't be of mean spirit. Don't be of mean spirit. I would hate to be fruitless. A mean spirit will not bear fruit for God. And she's born no children. 
Third thing I see here is that miracles don't save people. Human depravity is more powerful than God's miracles. Isn't it? That's, that's a frightening thought. You know, when, when Calvin talks about us being totally depraved, what he means is, is every part of our being has been ruined by sin. Every part. It's not one part of us. So, so the depravity of man is a vile thing. Vile thing. <clears throat> Judas, the high priests, they did not doubt the miracles. Can you believe it? They knew Lazarus was raised from the dead. They must have had thousands of people coming to tell them. And yet, what do they want to do? They want to kill him. And Jesus, they knew the miracles. That must, this is the vileness, this is the vileness of human nature. Some of you may remember Pastor Wally North, a very controversial character, but a wonderful man, um, very much a holiness teacher. He had a church in Bradford, and he, he told this story. <clears throat> One day he was walking down the road, and there was a couple coming towards him, quite a nice-looking couple, and he thought they had fish and chips in a big bag, because in those days, you know, you used to go... And you get your fish and chips, a thrums, in a in a, a bit of paper, and probably uh, the Daily Mirror or something. And when he, when he when he but when he went past them, he saw that they actually got a baby, and it was a thalidomide baby, and it was all twisted and broken, and um, and he got very quite emotional, and he talked to them about it. And they, he said, "Well, I'm 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 a minister." I've got a church here. So well, we know you. You're Pastor North, aren't you? Because he was well known. He said, can I pray for your child? And he prayed for the child. And then he moved on. He tells the story that 20 odd years later, he was walking uh, in Bradford. He, he didn't have a church there anymore. A guy called Pete Paris took it on, who always very blessed us with his prophetic ministry years ago. And he saw this couple coming towards him. And um, in fact, there were three of them. And there was a, 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 a very attractive young woman, probably in her 20s. And <clears throat> he, they said, oh, Pastor North. They said, do you know, I, I know I know you. How do I know you? And they said, don't you remember, you prayed for a, oh, yes. You know that little mite, poor little thing that you had? They said, yes. Well, here she is. And he said, oh. I mean, he was just ecstatic. He said, he said well, well, where do you fellowship? So they said, fellowship? Fellowship? No, don't, you, don't you go to a church? Oh, no. And he said he was shocked. There, there was a walking miracle. She was a flit of my child. And yet God had wonderfully healed her. And I remember not Wally and all saying, miracles don't, don't save people. Don't save people. The heart can be so hard. That even the raising from the dead of a man that's been in the tomb for four days will not convert. It's the heart. And, and, and folks, this is the world in which we live. I believe in the elect of God because it's in Scripture. I don't try and work it all out because my, my little brain isn't enough to work that out. I'm sorry, your big brain isn't either. But the last thing here, and this is where I want to just do a little bit of ministry at the end. Jesus knew that only his own life's blood could achieve man's freedom. So although this was a triumphal entry, it was triumphal not over the Romans. It was over the prince of the power of the air that holds us under the bondage of death. And it just speaks to us of what love the Father has for us. I remember some years ago at Stonely, <clears throat> um, C.J. Mahaney, that some of you would know, was preaching. And he, he began to speak about leaders, particularly church now. I think it was a leaders conference. He's speaking about leaders who always crave affirmation and as he's speaking, 
I was thinking, that's me. And, and I, I believe God spoke to me, and God said to me, the one man you want affirmation from, which was my dad, and uh, uh, not my dad was a bad man, but my dad was, he, he was orphaned when he was nine, he went to boarding school till he was 17, then he went into the war, then he was at Dunkirk, and then, then I was born, and there was Alamein, El Alamein, and he came home, and he did some pretty awful things, obviously. I mean, he killed people. Um, he never talked about it. He couldn't. And he could never say to me, well done, son, or I love you, son, or whatever. Even when I passed my exams, my A-levels, my law, law exams, and all that sort of thing, he could, he could never say, well done. I mean, when I passed my A-levels, I mean, you know, they weren't A-grades, but they were A-levels. <clears throat> he said, oh, I told so-and-so, so-and-so, and they asked me if it, to give you this as a thank you. It was a £10 note. That was a week's wages in those days. But it was from my dad. And, and I, we, Sue and I are reading through Mark's Gospel at the moment, and right at the beginning, he starts with John the Baptist, and then Jesus coming, and the baptism of Jesus, and that, that voice from heaven said, this is, my, this is my son, and I'm so thrilled, I'm so pleased with, with, with you. The affirmation. Well, if Jesus needed affirmation, <laughs> how much do, do we need affirmation? And I can remember... I remember God set me free that day as I repented. And, and, uh, and <laughs> as it was, God was very gracious to Sue and I because three months before my dad died, we were doing his garden because he got angina, he couldn't do it. And uh, he never ever said well done to me. He never came to a tennis final I played in. He just... He loved Sue, loved my kids... And he could be different with them than me. And we were there doing the garden, weren't we, Sue? And we mowing the lawn and doing this. And he come down and he, and he couldn't, he could hardly walk. And he, he, he was a bit like me. He didn't like being out of shape. He was an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> Want to get your tennis racket? <laughs> Want to get your tennis racket? Ask my big friend somewhere. Where are you? Yeah, ask Rambo, he'll tell you. <laughs> I love his big serves because now I've got, I can use his power to get it back, you see. But this is what happened. We were doing the garden and he'd come down and he said, son, oh God, I'm going to break here. What you're doing for me is wonderful. Thank you, it's marvellous. I thought, what? I'm crying. I said, Dad, do you mean that? He said, son, this is bloody marvellous, this is... <laughs> I was broken. I thought, God, you're so good. Because the one man I wanted it from, that God said, you, you're going to have to let me, let me affirm you. Right as he, before he died, it was emotion, wasn't it, Sue? God, dear me, I don't think Dad knew we were crying. I believe there may be some of you here today that, like me, you didn't know a father's love. You longed for it. You long for that affirmation. Others could give it, but there's something about a father's love. Why? Because our earthly fathers represent a heavenly father. <laughs> That's what they call fathers. And we need that. And um, Tom Wright, in his commentary on this, he says this. And I'm going to read it to you. Now I'm going to pray. He says, a, a famous movie maker, this is over the passage where Jesus is baptised of John. A famous movie maker had a, a huge legal wrangle with his longtime mentor and guide. The younger man simply couldn't handle criticism and ended up rejecting the person who had helped him so much. When it was all over, a close friend summed up the real problem. He said it was, it was all about the un an ungenerous father, he explained, and a son looking for affirmation and love. It happens all the time, says Tom, in families, businesses, all over. Many children grow up in, in our world who have never had a father say to them, either in words, in looks, or in hugs, you're my dear child, let alone I'm pleased with you. In the Western world, even those fathers who think this in their hearts are often too tongue-tied or embarrassed 
to tell their children how delighted they are with them. Many, alas, go by complete, by completely opposite route. Angry voices, bitter rejection, the slamming of doors. The whole Christian gospel could be summed up in this point, that when the living God looks at us, now folks, if this is you, this is you. I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up. This is between you and God like it was with me when, when C.J. Mahaney was free. If this is you, I want you just at this moment to ask the Holy Spirit to come and do a healing work in your heart. The whole Christian gospel <coughs> could be summed up in this point that when the living God looks at us, at every baptised and believing Christian, he says to us what he said to Jesus on that day. He sees us not as we are in ourselves, because sometimes we don't like ourselves, do we? I don't like myself sometimes. I think, Raylo, how can you react like that? You're supposed to be a man of God, for goodness sake. He says to us what he said to Jesus on that day. He sees us not as we are in ourselves, but as we are in Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be in Christ. It sometimes seems impossible especially the people who have never had this kind of support from their earthly parents. But it's true. God looks at us and says, you are my... I just close your eyes for a moment. For those of you that are identifying with what I share with you personally about myself and my dad, but it works for you as well, this is a moment that you're going to be set free. Come, Holy Spirit, now and set my friends free. God looks at us, he looks at you, and he says this, you are my dear, dear child. I am delighted with you. Try reading that sentence slowly with your own name at the start. Ray Lowe, you are my dear, dear child. Say your own name. You are my dear. This is work God's word. It's not me. This is God the Holy Spirit now. He's speaking these words to you. Lord, bring healing to the human heart now. The heart that loves you, Jesus, that has struggled to receive the Father's love. God is not angry or displeased with you. You are my dear, dear child. I'm delighted with you. Try reading that sentence slowly with your own name at the start and reflect quietly on God saying to you, both at your baptism and every day since. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? And if you've prayed that prayer, and others of you, I don't know everybody who's here this morning, but <clears throat> John wrote this gospel under the inspiration of the Spirit. You could come to know God. It's as simple as that. Why, why have we got all this? Why have we got this evidence? This evidence. This evidence would hold up in any court of law in the country. Any court of law. So I witness. It's what's called um, principal evidence. So if you're here today and you think, actually, I think I do believe, I'm not sure. Well, well make it sure. Just say to God. Just say to Jesus, Jesus, thank you. <laughs> say to God, thank you that you caused John, whoever the John was, to write this book because it's done me a power of good today. I'm now tasting the age to come. Oh, that's how powerful this word is. Yes? Yes. Yes. Let's just pray. We just thank you, Lord. <laughs> we are amazed this morning. All this stuff and so much more we could have gone through. All those psalms concerning Judas and 30 pieces of silver and all that. Boy, we could be here all day doing it because you want us to know you. And Lord, we pray we want to know you more. Lord, as Elder read for us this morning, we, we want to be like the deer that pants for the water, the living waters, Lord. We want to thirst. We want our passion, Lord, Lord, please, Lord Jesus, some of us are not very passionate, but Lord, help us to be passionate in the spirit 
about you, to worship you. Forgive us when we have looked at others and thought they're just totally over the top, not realising that they were just letting their hair down for Jesus. But we just, we just thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, that you knew you were the Lamb of God that had come to take away the sin of the world. And thank you. You knew that in that dying, you would defeat every principality and power, every demon, Lord, that ever, that ever shrieked. Now, now powerless because of the cross. And we just thank you, Lord. We thank you now as we break bread and pray for one another, Lord, that again, be in that, that, that sacrament that you've ordained for us, Lord, that we might be partakers of your flesh and your blood this morning in that spiritual sense and go home fully refreshed for being together with one another, loving one another and loving you, Lord. Let this church always be like that, we pray. Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ray. Bless you. The Bible says on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces. He said, this is my body which is given for you. This was just before, you know, good for, what we say is Good Friday, the night when he was betrayed. This is my body which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we're going to break bread. In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, said, this is the cup, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus is coming again. We want to break bread, remember him, give thanks to him. We're going to worship God, so there's a number of stations around. Please do break bread with one another. Let's, uh, let's remember the Lord Jesus. Uh, I think all of it is non-alcoholic as well, so I just want to really honour uh, those who maybe struggle at times with that. But hey, let's, let's worship Jesus. And uh, as you feel just ready to, go and get some bread and wine and just enjoy the Lord. Let's worship again. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one King reigning over all. So I will not fear, for this truth remains that my God. Oh
Lord, as we, Lord, as we are your witnesses this week, we pray, oh God, that your name is glorified. We pray, Lord God, that you get all the glory and all the honor. We worship you again this morning. Lord, help us to be like that, Mary. Lord, just pouring out, Lord, our lives for you. Thank you, Lord, that you poured out your life for us. Thank you, Lord, that blood was shed so that we would uh, live forever. We thank you, Lord. We pray, oh God, bless us as we enjoy the rest of this day in fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's enjoy fellowship together.